in the context of hormone optimization, that is typically where you're going to get the most bang for your buck in terms of quality of life, well-being, not putting yourself in like excessive, you know, risk territory. What's up guys, Derek, moreplacemoredates.com. Today we're gonna be talking about the difference between total testosterone, free testosterone, bioavailable testosterone. So this is a topic that I feel should be put into layman's terms and often goes, you know, overlooked and sort of just gets skimmed over in videos talking about hormone optimization. And frankly, I always kind of just like assume people know what I'm talking about when I should really just, you know, break it down in layman's terms. Cause this is something, you know, not that long ago, I didn't know very much about either, to be honest. Like it's only within the past few years, I've really dug into this stuff with, you know, extreme amounts of detail to the point where I even feel qualified to somewhat, you know, elaborate on this process here of endocrinology. So basically when testosterone, enter, testosterone enters the bloodstream, it either gets bound up by sex hormone binding globulin, which I'm sure you've heard of, SHBG, um, or attaches to albumin. Now the proportion of what attaches to what, this is a bit of a, you know, there's gonna be variability in person to person, as well as just the general ranges are often not consistently reported between different lab values or different people who are talking about this. So just in general, a very broad range, it's about 30 to 45% of your total testosterone that gets bound up by SHBG. And then of the rest of it, 50 to 68 percent albumin it's a very specific number 50 to 68 but that's just that's what it is and then very you know interestingly enough a very very small percentage is actually freely circulating and directly available to tissues and that percentage is anywhere from you know roughly two to three percent so you have 30 to 45 at shbg 50 to 68 at albumin and then you know roughly two to three percent free in an unbound state it's not like no one really understands fully the, the mechanisms of SHBG haven't been fully elucidated yet in the clinical data or just in even in bro science. We don't really know what the fuck it does other than acting as a potentially a delivery mechanism to target tissues as well as a way to regulate estrogen to androgen balance or I should say free estrogen to free androgen balance and you know there's a reason why there is a differing proportion between female females and males and you know, the way it sort of regulates how much in the body each tissue gets and how it delivers it to each tissue to maintain certain homeostatic mechanisms in the body and keep you healthy, essentially. So it's not like it's just the devil. Like a lot of people think, oh, you got to crush SHBG to increase your free test. It's like in reality, something that goes overlooked too is if you crush your SHBG into the ground, you can enter a state of not only can you be extremely androgen dominant, and this is where you encounter situations with women with like PCOS and they have, you know, viralizing side effects just from their endogenous androgen dominant state. In men too, if you're low SHBG, if it's in the ground, you can hyper excrete, excrete testosterone. So it's almost just like, it's all free flowing. There's nothing, you know, essentially acting as a, not necessarily kind of like a reserve I should say it's kind of a hard way to describe it because it's not like this is a like I said the mechanism hasn't been fully elucidated so it's kind of just like me sort of relaying what is suggested in the clinical data as well as anecdotally so basically it acts almost like a reserve thinking think of it of like iron versus ferritin if you have like a certain amount that your body's holding on to to then regulate what needs what and then get what gets delivered to what if all of it is unbound and freely available you basically hyper excrete it and can end up in a state where you are, especially for somebody who's reliant on exogenous hormones like TRT, if your SHBG is in the toilet and you pin your test, you can end up just like flushing it out of your body way quicker than somebody who has a sufficient amount of SHBG, SHBG to actually bound up a certain amount of tests to regulate how much target tissues get and sort of maintain a proper balance between the hormone profile rather than just everything's like a fucking geyser going off the chain and then just like flies out of your body and it's all unregulated essentially. So basically free testosterone is essentially what is associated with all the benefits you associate typically with testosterone. So like when you think of libido, when you think of, uh, you know, gaining muscle mass, when you think of that kind of stuff, that's free testosterone. It's because it's not attached 
were bound up by the SHBG or the albumin, it can actually, you know, exert its effects directly on target tissues. And it's what is largely going to determine if you have hypogonadal symptoms or not. So the next thing is the SHBG bound, which is something that binds with a, I guess in layman's terms, it binds it harder than albumin. It's basically has a higher affinity for DHT, significantly more so than testosterone, then testosterone, and then estrogen is the lowest affinity. And basically it holds a inverse relationship with your free T because it's essentially what regulates how much free T you're going to get. So this is why some guys intentionally take things like Proviron to, you know, bound to essentially compete for shbg binding and free up more testosterone to be used in tissues and you know for some people with you know high shbg this might be a short-term therapy worth pursuing in some context but for many you know the importance on lowering shbg is largely overstated and often completely unjustified in my opinion but anyways Basically, you have to know that SHBG bound is not really, the testosterone bound up by it isn't, like it's considered inactive essentially because it can't really do what free testosterone does. It's basically bound up and, you know, rendered inactive whereby it kind of like waits until your body needs it to then, you know, deliver it to where it needs to go. But, you know, there's mechanisms that haven't been elucidated yet as well that sort of think that SHBG bound test isn't necessarily doing nothing it might have certain effects too but that's like above and beyond what i even know but anyways there's theories about that but basically at the level of knowledge we have now what we believe is that is it's essentially a regulating mechanism and bounds up a bunch of your total to essentially determine how much free you get to each tissue then if you have like high shbg you're going to have a low free t often and if you have low dht you're going to have a probably a low free T as well. Like there's a lot of situations in which your SHBG is going to determine essentially how androgen dominant you are. So this is why, you know, women, for example, if you take uh, birth control orally and it spikes your SHBG through the roof, you could end up in a position where you have your libido goes down because all of a sudden now you have, despite your testosterone on paper, perhaps not being that much affected, your free T proportionally is significantly more affected in a negative way. Kind of a side tangent that I probably shouldn't delve into because it's going to gonna get too confusing. But in the like in the context of a man and hormone optimization, your SHBG, just like anything else, you don't want too low and you won't you don't want it too high. There's going to be an unhealthy range of anything, and crushing into the ground isn't going to be good, despite what many might lead you to believe. And the higher your SHBG, the less free tests you're going to have, the lower your SHBG, the more free tests you're going to have, but at the consequence of potentially excreting it faster than otherwise needed and or creating an androgen dominant profile in addition to, you know, other downstream consequences potentially. I th basically, you want to have everything, you know, in an optimal area, but not too much or too little. So that's basically without getting too off track here, which I've already done getting to albumin bound. So it's a carrier protein, just like SHBG, but as a lower affinity to bind. So this is why it's considered, you know, like biologically active because it can easily break free from albumin as opposed to SHBG. It's more so of a tight, tight bind, I guess. And the bioavailable is essentially just the albumin bound plus the free, whereas the total is everything. So you have total is all the testosterone. If you have your bioavailable, it's the free plus the albumin bound, which is also referred to as the weekly bound because it is more likely to break free and be then freely available to target tissues. Then you have the free, which is the smallest amount in the body, the two to 3% that's actually the freely, you know, circulating around to do what testosterone, all the good things you think, you know, testosterone does. So what do you typically, when we look at blood tests, again, there's, you know, a lot of debate in the community about how useful seeing what's in your serum really is. But realistically, it's a good gauge to evaluate, even if it's not, you know, there's the involvement of paracrine and intracrine hormones. And, you know, there's all this, uh, you know, new discussion around, you know, aromatase activity in the tissues versus 5-alpha reductase activity in the tissues um, and how, you know, blood tests are fucking irrelevant now and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, at the end of the day, this is what we have to go with. And this is regardless if it doesn't exactly tell you what is in a 
target material or an organ or whatever, you're not gonna get a biopsy of like your scalp or something. Like most people can't afford that. We're getting blood tests. That's what we have access to. So that's what we're gonna go by. And this is what we can use as a way to establish, you know, a pattern of activity. So if you have hypogonadal symptoms, we know that's typically associated with a free testosterone on the lower end of normal. So despite the fact that perhaps that is just, you know, something in your blood, we can still use that as a proxy to figure out your androgen status in general. And it is fairly accurate that we've seen over the years. So this is what I would still recommend going off of because it's the thing that is generally applicable to all of us. And even all the stuff I just said about paracrine and intracrine hormones, most people don't even know what the fuck I'm talking about. And ultimately, I don't think you need to delve into it too much. I think you need to understand the basics of blood work first. So ideally, if you want a high level of function, you would typically like to see a testosterone on the high end of normal of total as well as free. This doesn't mean that you're not going to have symptoms if you're on the high end of a reference range. This is indeed a reference range after all of an average. It's not indicative of what you might need individually. It is an average after all. So just because you fall on the high end of the reference range, it doesn't mean you might not need more than 99% of other people to feel normal, or you also might not need that much to feel normal. So it all kind of is individual dependent at the end of the day. But in general, if you fall on the high end of the quote unquote reference range, you will probably, you know, be optimized for the most part. And there's obviously, you know, different reference ranges with different labs. But, you know, in general, I would say anything above like 700 nanograms per deciliter on a total is like at least ballpark. You're starting to look at like decent levels, in my opinion. Perhaps they're not, you know, optimal for 90, like, the 1% of people that are going to be potentially hypogonadal symptoms still, despite having, you know, a 1000 nanogram total. But then you look at the free as well. And the problem is a lot of doctors that are looking at, and just people evaluating the blood work in general, they're looking at their total, not just their free. They're, or I should say they're looking at their total and not their free. You should be looking at both. So in your free, you would ideally also see on the higher end of normal of the reference range. Now, it doesn't mean you need to have it there. I just mean in the context of hormone optimization, that is typically where you're going to get the most bang for your buck in terms of quality of life, well-being, not putting yourself in like excessive, you know, risk territory, as well as, you know, maximizing, you know, muscle building outcomes, you know, sex drive, uh, mental function, acuity, neurology, all these kind of things that you want to, you know, be optimized, but still not like accidentally kill yourself. So I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen. I'm just saying there is a therapeutic amount where more is not always better. And ideally it should be based on, you know, I don't want to get too off track. Basically you want to shoot for a high normal as a baseline ballpark. And then from there you can gauge based on if you're symptomatic still, and uh, based on you know other biomarkers and whatnot, but in general, you want a free and a total on the high end of normal, and most people are gonna feel better at those levels, in my opinion, and that is what I shoot for personally. And I highly recommend you find a doctor who actually understands endocrinology and pharmacology as well, and can properly assess your blood work and manage your hormone profile with you in an open-minded way that is not closed off to the idea of science progressing and is stuck in their methods of TRT from 10 to 15 years ago. Cause there's a lot of doctors that still do the cookie cutter bullshit. We'll give you AIs, they'll give you, you know, HCG to use with your TRT without even asking. They'll do a bunch of bullshit. They won't use high sensitivity testing. If you want to accurately test your total test and your free test, you don't need this. Again, these are just, you know, proxies for certain, you know, health markers at the end of the day. Personally, what I would get is a total testosterone is most accurately evaluated through liquid chromatography with tandem mass spectrometry, which is LCMSMS is the abbreviation on whenever you're ordering your blood work. If you want to get accurate bioavailable or free testosterone check, Typically, you would be best served, in my opinion, most bang for your buck is checking your total as well as your free. And with your free, I would use either equilibrium ultrafiltration or equilibrium dialysis if you have that available. Both are far more accurate than radioaminoassay, which is the default they will typically give you, which is not really accurate, in my opinion, based on what I've seen. And um, again, at the end of the day, even if you have you know, amino assay results, 
You can just compare them to one another and get a pattern and sort of you know gauge symptoms based on that. But if you want really accurate blood work, I recommend getting LCMS MS for your total, equilibrium ultrafiltration or dialysis for your free. And that is as well as obviously having a proper you know patient care coordinator and or doctor who is going to work with you in an open-minded way to explain your blood work not just tell you oh you're fucked and like here's what you need here's your arimidex like actually <laughs> understands how to manage health optimization in a intelligent way and is not just trying to prescribe you shit to make money so anyways one thing i am actually doing now is i am teaming up with a hormone replacement therapy clinic which is something that has been in the works for a while and is a no-brainer for somebody like myself so if you want to get connected with the patient care coordinator that i would recommend you get in touch with for your hormone replacement needs i will link them in the video description below as well as a code if you want to get a discount off your first consultation with them where they're not going to force you to take shit. they're going to actually properly evaluate your health status and then steer you in the right direction and this uh, patient care coordinator in particular actually follows my stuff and is somebody i have talked to back and forth about health optimization and hormone management for a long time now with actually developed a relationship and confidence in him before we even talked about the business side of things so i highly recommend you check that out and uh, i have confidence in them above and beyond all these other bullshit clinics that just want to make money off you so Highly recommend you check that out. They are in the video description below if you want to uh, get hooked up with the people that I trust myself. So anyways, as well as anything else, if you want to support the channel, you can check out uh, Gorilla Mode, GorillaMode.com, GorillaMind.com, my uh, turnkey pre-workout formula. Just compare it to the label of your current pre and I guarantee you won't be disappointed. And you'll see pretty quickly why ours is superior to every other company that's out there right now, as well as anything I'm associated with is going to be in the description below. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, I post unique stuff there sometimes, worth checking out, at more plates underscore more dates, Facebook, Snapchat, BitChute, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts, wherever I am. Notification bell too, or otherwise you won't get notified when I post. So if you want to get uh, deep dives into pharmacology too, check out my site, because it gets into more elaborate detail on this stuff. So thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.